If I asked you to picture someone who pulled off a massive Ponzi scheme, say that his business was a giant Ponzi scheme, you'd probably imagine a traditional businessman type. That's probably because almost all of us will have Bernie Madoff in our heads about now. But even though his Ponzi scheme was insanely successful, he's sure not the only person who's pulled off that scam with great success. You can add this unlikely scam artist to the list of people who stole millions of dollars through a surprisingly simple ruse. But who is he? How did he do it? And more importantly, what happened next? Let's take a closer look at this amazing crime. This is Nevin Shapiro. You might know him as a former booster for the Miami Hurricanes, or you might know him as the man who executed one of the biggest Ponzi schemes of all time. He was born in 1969 in Brooklyn, New York, before his parents moved to Miami. At a young age, he became a huge fan of the Miami Hurricanes. At Miami Beach Senior High School, he was on the wrestling and basketball teams, and he played at a pretty high level until he graduated in 1986. After that, his life changed a bit. His mom decided to get remarried. The man she chose was Richard Armand Adam. He and Nevin's mom forced Nevin to attend the University of South Florida in Tampa. Nevin didn't have much of a choice. He went, and he did find a place for himself there, playing football, but it didn't last. Nevin got into a fight with a fellow player during a football match, and he knocked the other guy out cold. Sources differ on what happened next. Either Nevin decided to drop out, or the university expelled him. Either way, that was the end of his university career. Interestingly, Nevin's new stepdad went on to be convicted of a multi-million dollar scam too. He was basically taking fees for loans that he never actually gave out. Who knows if that influenced Nevin's future in some way. Nevin finally opened his first business, Nevco Trading, in 1998. Within a year, it was shut down. The business hadn't been fulfilling its contractual obligations, and someone decided to sue them. The business went under, and Nevin had to find something new to do. And he sure did. One year after the closure of his last business, Nevin opened the infamous Capital Investments USA. If you checked what the business did, you would have read that it bought wholesale groceries and redistributed them to markets with higher prices so the business could make a profit. However, no groceries were ever bought or sold by the company. Unfortunately, none of the investors knew that, and Nevin had convinced a lot of people to invest in his new business. How? He told them they'd make between 10 and 26% commission every month. Sounds like a great deal except for the fact that the business didn't exist. Nevin had all the documents to prove these claims, of course, but every single one of them was a forgery that Nevin had made. The investors had no way of knowing any of this at the time. Meanwhile, Nevin now had so much cash that he decided he'd pay a whopping $12,000 to make himself an official booster for Miami University. That was petty cash to Nevin in many ways. At one point during his scam, he owned a $1 million yacht and a mansion worth $5 million, but he was only attracting more controversy as a booster. His techniques weren't exactly above board, and he had a lot of people going along with them. They were not just bending, but totally breaking NCAA rules. According to some sources, this is estimated to have affected over 100 players who were receiving unethical benefits. However, the number Nevin gave was 75. At least seven coaches from Miami's football and basketball teams were totally aware of what was happening, and some were even actively involved in it. What exactly was going on? Well, a few things. Nevin was basically handing recruits far more benefits than he was allowed to. Going against the NCAA, Nevin and the coaches were handing recruits checks for huge sums of money and calling them grants, even though grants for that much cash aren't allowed. Nevin was also hosting some of the biggest and most lavish parties Miami had ever seen, and this was all for the players to enjoy. Of course, these parties came with the full package, alcohol, illegal substances, strippers, and sometimes prostitutes. But it didn't stop there. There. To make the players even happier, he even let them use his yacht to go on private events and gave them expensive presents like cars and luxury brand apparel. Absolutely none of this was allowed, to say the least. There was still something else that Nevin did to players that was extremely unethical. He was putting bounties on opponent players. Basically, he was paying his recruits if they could knock specific players out of a game. One of these bounties was on Seminoles quarterback Chris Ricks. Any player who guaranteed he was out of the game would earn themselves $5,000. This bounty stood for a shocking three years. I think you'll all agree that's not a very sportsmanlike thing to do, and many people were appalled when they finally heard about it. In 2007, this scandal hit rock bottom thanks to Nevin. After Miami's last home game at the Orange Bowl, where they suffered an embarrassing 48-0 defeat, Nevin lost his temper. He'd spotted Miami University's Associate Athletic Director for Compliance, David Reed, in the press box. He decided to start a full-on fight in front of everyone. Nevin accused him of trying to keep boosters and players apart and said the team was suffering as a result. Really, he didn't phrase it that nicely, but we can't repeat the words he actually used. The fight was broken up before Nevin 
and could throw any punches, but he made no secret that that's exactly what he wanted to do. None of this looked good. As a result of his behavior, an investigation was started. Nevin had no idea that people were discovering his shady dealings behind the scenes. As far as he knew, he was riding high, but things started to turn when the 2008 recession hit. With money being so tight, nobody was willing to invest any more cash into capital investments. That was pretty bad for Nevin. See, he kept his older investors happy by sometimes handing them a little cash he'd gotten from new investors. This made them think they were making money back on their investments. This method was super successful. Over the years, Nevin had stolen a mind-blowing $930 million from investors through capital investments. Now do you see why I said it was one of the most successful Ponzi schemes in history? The scheme relied on this method, but it doesn't work if nobody's investing. Nevin tried to fix the situation by selling off his jewelry in his condo in the Bahamas to make his interest payments and prevent an investigation into what was really going on. After all, you definitely don't want the FBI to discover you've stolen nearly a billion dollars. But it wasn't enough. One by one, investors were suing Capital Investments. In November 2009, Capital Investments filed for bankruptcy. But that wasn't the worst thing that was about to happen to Nevin. Finally, one investor got so angry that he told the police that something fishy might be going on. He was right. His complaints spiraled into a full-blown FBI investigation into Capital Investments. This was 2011, and a scandal on that scale with a booster right at the heart of it wasn't a good thing for Miami. It was now that they decided to reveal all the scandalous activity they had discovered Nevin was involved in as a booster. The revelations were so enormous that they kicked off an investigation across all universities to check up on who else was blatantly breaking NCAA rules. It turned out there were a lot of shady dealings going on that had nothing to do with Nevin, and it left the NCAA disgraced. But Nevin had bigger problems. He was in court facing charges of money laundering and fraud. The FBI had gathered so much evidence against him there was nothing he could do except plead guilty and confess to everything. So that's what he did. He told them about the forged documents, the way he paid off investors, and how his business never bought a single box of groceries even though that's what he claimed they were doing. Of course, he was always going to be found guilty. He was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison for his crimes and was ordered to pay over $82.5 million in restitution. But that's not the end of the story. In 2020, things changed. When news of the pandemic broke, prisons decided to allow certain prisoners to serve out their sentences under house arrest. Nevin was one of them. Unbelievably, after all his crimes, he was basically back to a comfortable life. He was transferred to a relative's house where he was allowed to stay as long as he complied with BOP guidelines. At the time, he said that prison had been an eye-opening experience and he was happy to be able to look after his parents and move forward with his life. As shocking as it is, he's currently still living at home. Do you think that's justice? Let us know in the comments.